Oh, hello there. Happy Thursday, friends. How you folks doing? Sorry, I had to go refill my cup of coffee here. This is my mug I got here at Jellystone. Super excited, although I should be careful trying to put it over my laptop. Don't want to spill there. All right, we got a couple things today. Um, we're going to actually, only one thing, I guess. We're just finishing up types, so maybe a couple things is wrong. But then we're going to talk about our project. Right. We're gonna finish up types. We'll talk about our first individual project. So two things. That is a couple, right? Two is a couple. All right. So how are you folks doing today? We're uh, week four. Wow. This has been flying by here. I only see you folks on Mondays, so um, hopefully things are going well. And you got all your coffee. Coffee is the important thing here. Let me see who's around. All right, cool. I think a lot of people are opting to just watch asynchronously, which, sure, it's no problem. Um, honestly, though, I do get a little, little uh, bored just uh, talking to myself here. So I, I do like when you're in chat asking questions and stuff. So, all right, let's play up Pie Charm here. I should have done that first. I forgot Pie Charm takes a long time. We'll get there. Okay, so while that loads, we can do a quick review, right? Some of the types we've talked about before. Here we have our, our basic types where we're storing numeric values. We have our ints and we have our floats for storing numeric values. We have strings for storing a bunch of text. Um, you can technically do those individual characters. Um, don't Doesn't get us a whole lot. And we can do some fun stuff with it later. Hey, Trumpet Man, thanks so much for hopping in here and chat. You know, it's it's been a week. It's been a week. We're getting into the routine. We're, we're getting into... September, um, you know, life, life is pretty good. Our uh, Leo, which is the Lecturer's Employee Organization, uh, officially accepted the new contract we have with the University of Michigan, which covers all lecturers across all three campuses at the University of Michigan, which is pretty cool. Um, um, the, the highlight of that, which was pretty cool, a lot of our Ann Arbor friends were sticking their necks out for us, is that now new starting lecturers actually... Um, two years from now, in the third year of our contract, uh, we'll make the same amount of money as a lecturer uh, makes at Ann Arbor if you are a lecturer at Dearborn or if you're a lecturer at Flint. Um, previously, Ann Arbor got paid uh, quite a bit more than lecturers at Ann Arbor or le lecturers at Dearborn and Flint, so that's pretty exciting. Hey, ABC123. <laughs> I like it. Hey, did you guys know I just found out why the Star Wars movies were released in, in order 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, which, which seems really out of order. But I, I found out there was actually a reason for it. Um, and it's not just because of George Lucas being silly. Um, it's because they, they asked Yoda to pick the order. All right. So we got our ints for our numbers. We got our floats. We got our characters. And we're doing a little bit there. We've got these, and then sequence types, where we can have a, a sequence of values here. And we have the immutable sequence types. <laughs> I'm glad you liked that one, ABC. Um, all right, strings. We it's a sequence of characters. We can get individual characters out letter by letter if we want, but you can't change them. And then tuple or tuple, and I prefer tuple. Um, it can really be anything. And we're going to use our parentheses to create them. You can It can be a collection, a sequence of anything that you want. And then for mutable types, types that are changeable, right? We have a list. The order matters. We can append. We can remove. We can pop. You can actually, with a list here, we didn't practice that. But if we have a list, 
Let me uh, zoom this in a little bit more here. We'll go down a bunch of lines. All right, so if you have uh, some numbers in a list, and let's do, I don't know, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. Right, so we have a bunch of numbers in a list all by itself. Uh, why is it upset with me? Oh, my tabbing is off here. That's why. There we go. So I had a, a little red line there, and it was telling me, and I actually didn't look at the error, it's an unexpected indent, where everything needs to be left aligned, or if it belongs to something, it's tabbed in one. All right, so we have some numbers. Then what I can do with some numbers, right, there's an option for insert. You can insert a value at a given index. So if you wanted to, you could say, hey, insert at the zeroth index. Let's insert a two. And then we could take some numbers and we could insert at the zeroth index. Let's insert a one. So it's going to put it in front of the list instead of like append. We'll always put it at the end of the list. Insert will put it really anywhere we want. Um, doesn't matter. We're using index zero saying put it at the front of the list. And then if I were to print some numbers, we should now have all of our powers of two. Right. Let's give that a shot. Uh, 100, I think you needed 85 in there, right? Otherwise it would break. There we go. And here's our sum numbers. So 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. Because we inserted them at a given index. And you can pick any index. You can put them anywhere you want. Oh, man. Is my Wi-Fi giving me trouble again? I think something's wrong with my... It's been relatively stable, but I, I lose the Wi-Fi every now and then. I don't know if it's my Comcast network, or if it's just the wireless adapter on this laptop, but laptops pushing two and a half years old now, which is sad. Laptops don't really last as long as, um, you know, electronics should. We'll see. All right. So that, that's the quick um, review. Uh, sets are in order doesn't matter, right? With a list, the order matters. You put it at the first, the second, the third, right? The, you have an index of where you put it. Sets don't have an order. All right, glad, glad it's good from the way. I'm watching like the kilobits a second that I'm getting for my upload, and every now and then it, it bounces on me. So, so sets order doesn't matter, and then dictionary is really cool because that's a mapping type. We get a key and an associated value. Um, you're going to see dictionaries are amazingly powerful. You can do all sorts of cool things with dictionaries. Um, we're going to make lots of use of them over this semester and next semester as well. Um, it's a fantastic type in Python. So that's some of the, the basic types that we're going to work with. Now, with strings, we can do some really cool things um, in terms of formatting. So if we were to have, uh, let's see, uh, let's ask somebody, uh, let's, we'll print, what is your major? And then we'll get their major. Right? So we'll say major is equal to the input of, oh, I'm sorry, we don't even have to print it, right? We can just stick that right in the input if we want. Sure, what's your major? Great, and then we could ask them, um, year maybe or i don't know year in school is probably better year in school we'll put what year of school are you in like and maybe tell them like hey freshman sophomore is, is there an o in there sophomore or something no sophomore why doesn't it like it did i spell it wrong typo Oh, it wasn't O. I thought I had it there and it still didn't like it. Sophomore, junior, senior. All right, and anytime we're, we're prompting the user, it's helpful to give them, like, hey, this is what I'm expecting to get back from you. But if we just say what well, year, they might say first, second, third, fourth. Right? And, you know, sure. All right, so then if we wanted to print out, um, the, like, to have a nicely formatted string, we might want to say something like, um, so it's name is and then is a and then major and then in there and then year in school sophomore year or something like so okay name is a whatever their major is in there whatever year you're in year right, we should be able to do something like this it shouldn't be too bad here you get eric sure 185 100 what's your major all right so um Mine is automotive systems and mobility. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm not in 
graduate school. I don't think you count freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. I'll just put graduate. <laughs> I don't know. So Eric is an automotive system mobility. Oops, I uh, forgot the word major. Major in their comma year in school. And this is all fine, right? So we've got a nice little string going here, but it's a little bit awkward to read, right? Where I've got this and then a comma and then a this and then a comma and then a this and then a, a comma and then another string and another string and another string. So an easier way of doing this is called string formatting. Sorry, I think I've had so much coffee now. I'm like wiggling left and right in my chair. Got a little bit of the, you know, the, the fidgets going on. It's so nice though. Um, I miss when I'm in classrooms, I can't drink in class because we have our masks and stuff. And my mouth gets really dry. So it's nice to be able to drink my coffee as we go. So anyway, uh, if we wanted to have a nicely um, formatted string, what we can do is we're going to put a string in here and then essentially we're going to put in substitutions here. Okay, so um, we're going to say curly braces. So curly braces is the sign for a substitute. So inside of a string, if we have a set of curly braces, it's an indication of, hey, this is a placeholder for something. We say is a another placeholder, major in there, another placeholder here. So I'm giving it a single string here. So I don't need to have quote, unquote, variable, quote, unquote, another variable, quote, unquote, another variable. I just have a single string with these placeholder marks, these curly braces. And then we'll say dot format. So I give it the string and then I put dot format in. And then in parentheses, I'm going to give it all of the things we want to substitute in order. So the first thing here, the second thing, the third thing. So we'll give it name, comma, major, comma, year in school. And it will format those into this string. So it's just going to do a, a little replace. So here's a string. It's going to take the first thing, plug it into the first one. The second one, plug it into the second one. Third one, plug it into the third one. And on and on and on. So it's a, a little bit easier on the eyes and easier to type because you don't need to have start a string, end a string, comma, here's a variable, start a string, end a string, here's a variable, on and on and on and on. It, it works out a little bit nicer here. So let's give that a shot real quick. Let's see... All right, so let's try it again. So Eric, 185, 100, sure, 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 sure. Um, the motive, motive, systems and mobility, graduate, sure. So anyway, you get the exact same output here, which is what we wanted. We wanted an easier way of getting this output. Um, and maybe you don't think it's easier, but generally dealing with a single string here, instead of having to say string and then another string and then another string and another string, um, this is going to work out a little bit nicer for us to do this string formatting. So we're going to use this a lot. And then the other cool thing you can do is we can do additional formatting on numeric values. So if we have um, numbers with decimal places, it's easy, us, easy for us to format. If you want to say, hey, I want exactly this many decimal places, we can do that sort of thing. Um, so let's see. So if we wanted to say, um, how about what time is it here? So if we wanted to print the time, let's ask them here. So we'll, we'll say we have the hour with an input of what hour is it? And this, you know, let's do it as an integer here so we can do some, some math. Right. If it's an integer, we can do some arithmetic. And then we'll have minutes is an int of an input of what minute is it. And if we were just to print that out, right, even with our nicely formatted string, right? Substitute, colon, substitute, right? For hour, colon, minute. Right? We could print that with the dot format, and we'd format it in hour, and we'd format it in minute. And this should be fine, right? So Eric. 100, 85, 100. I'm just going to put some gibberish in there. Okay, so what hour is it? We'll say it is 15, right? Or, or you like 3, right? Because you, you regular time, 12 hour clock, 48. We'll get 3 colon 48. Okay, that looks all right. But what if we wanted to say, like, if I, if I say it's 1, like 301, usually you want the 0 in here. So what we can do is we can use a formatter. Now, don't don't bother memorizing any of these. Just know that you can format numbers here. So I'm going to say, okay, sure, I want a colon. So colon is the, the notation inside of my substitute marks here to say, okay, I want to format this thing. 
Right? I'm going to apply a particular format. And what we can do then is we can say, okay, I want a, I want a leading zero here. And then it's a did D for digit. This one is always kind of confusing here. You use F for floating point, you use D for digit, if that's helpful. I wish it was I for integer, but it's not. And, and again, I, I don't know why. We'll say colon zero D for digit. And we'll do the same for hour two. Okay, so if I said it was one, we would get 01. Uh, maybe you don't do that for hours. I don't know, we'll leave that alone for hours. We'll do it just for the minutes here. Let's give that a shot. All right, what hour is it? So if we said, hey, it's one, I don't know, we're, we're at three, right? But the minute, if we said it was like one, like 301. Oh, it didn't do it. Um, didn't do it. Oh, I didn't tell it how many, I'm sorry. So you have to give it how many values we want. So we want two values here. You have that one more time here, sorry. Rerun it. See, this is this is why this stuff is obnoxious sometimes. Don't bother memorizing. Just go look it up and maybe copy it better next time. So one, one, there we go. So now we get, hey, it's 101. So we're saying, hey, I want at least two digits here with a leading zero. So if I give it a regular time, right, it shouldn't give me an extra zero. It's only going to give me a zero if you need an extra digit. And again, this is just to make our, our output look a little bit nicer here. Oops, that was not a score. I got excited. And it's doing gibberish. 100. 85, 100, SDF, ASDF, all right, so 3, and if we said 50, we're going to get 350. We don't get the extra leading digit or anything. So this is great. You can't, uh, there's ways to format strings with some additional things, but it, that's a little bit trickier. Um, so this works really well with numeric values. And usually if it's a, it's a string, you don't want to like add a bunch of zeros or anything like that. So with our numeric values, Right, we can do this leading digits here, or if we had some sort of division, right, and we wanted to get just some number of um, decimal places, we could say, okay, this is string, and then we want to format. Let's do like three divided by seven, right? So three divided by seven with no formatting should give us one thing. And if we want to format that, if we want just a specific number of decimal places, we use colon. And say okay right i want to format it and then point how many decimal places do we want let's do to two decimal places and then f because it's a floating point number so colon point two f should give me two decimal places right and i'm just going to double check what should we get here with three divided by seven um nope that's in programmer calculator it doesn't work three divided by seven there we go so it should be a big number right that's that's kind of a, a funny one let's give it a run see what we get here Oh, those are scores. One, one, and here we go. So we can see, and with the formatter, it even rounds it for you, which is nice. You don't have to worry about that. So it's not like truncating the decimal, it's actually rounding for us. So 4, 0.428 rounds up to 4.3, 0.43. Right, so there's lots of really cool notations here that you can use. All right, um, you can do a named replacement. I'm not as big of a fan of that, um, so I, I, I don't bother. You just take a look if you want to see it in the Zybooks, how you can do the named replacement, or you can even do it um, by position value, and I think that's even more confusing, where they say, hey, you substitute the first thing or the second thing, or you could say, hey, substitute the third thing and then the second thing and then the first thing. Um, I, I think that's just awful and, and really awfully confusing, so I wouldn't bother with that. All right, so let's keep moving here. There's one other way, and it's not showing me. One second, let me oh, grab this one here. Um, let's see. Hmm. Yes, here we go. Okay, so a string interpolation is really cool. And I don't think it was showing us in here. Let me let me double check. It, it might be in a, a separate section. I'm just getting confused because that happens a lot too. Give me one second. Let me find it here. 
let's uh, search. And no result. Okay, it's not finding it here. Let me, let me use the other word. Compilation. Why is it not giving it to me here? Okay, so it's not in the text, which is obnoxious, but that's okay. So the the um, other way of doing this without even having to use the dot format notation, uh, and I'm a big fan of this one here, it's really nice, um, is called string interpolation. Uh, and this is getting more common in other languages as well. So what you do with it is instead of having to say format, right, we can say, hey, I'm going to give you a special string here called an f string so it's in front of a string we put an f to say this is a formatted string and then instead of just having a placeholder okay, let's do it with this one here we'll do it one more time here let's put it down here so as an f string notice these turn orange because it's getting this special notation here so instead of just saying there's a placeholder inside the placeholder i actually give it the variable name And then you don't have to use this dot format notation. So we can just say, hey, print a formatted string. Uh, it's technically string interpolation is your fancy term for it. But now inside that string, we get to actually put our variables inside those placeholders. And this is even nicer than this dot format notation because then it's really, really hard to get these out of order, right? Because this goes in the order in which you place them. So this formatted string is fantastic. I'm a big fan of that. And you can give it that same sort of, um, sorting notation here. Let me do this again here. So if we wanted to here, we could do it again with a formatted string, right? So this was hour, colon, and then minute, colon, 02D. So what value is it? And then colon, how do we want to format it? Right, so you can still use all that cool formatting notation that we were doing before with a formatted string or this interpolated string here. This will be 3 divided by 7, colon, 0.2f. 0.2f. There we go. Um, let's give that a shot. We should get the exact same results out. So this string interpolation is fantastic. Even better than the format. But um, this is newer, slightly newer. Um, let's see, when did this one come out? Made it into what version of Python? Oh, goodness, where is it? I had a version here, didn't it? Um, hmm. Not seeing where it was. That's all right. Um, I'm sure we could Google when it was. Anyway, let's keep going. So automotive systems. Sure. Graduate. Right, we get the exact same output looking good so far. So it's three... 57, we get the same output. Oh, we didn't actually do that one for the, oh yeah, we did, yeah, our formatted string here, 357. And we get our same formatted hours for three divided by seven. So this string interpolation, these F strings or formatted strings is probably the easiest way to go about doing that. And we can use these strings anywhere we want. It's fantastic. Right, it's gonna be a little funny, like the syntax is kind of funny. Um, you just gotta be a little bit careful on them, but um, I think with a little bit of practice, you'll get there. Okay, does that make sense? So strings are really cool. We can do a lot of really cool things with them. All right, cool. I think that covers everything for strings. Our formatting. All right, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about the math module in Python. So in the Python library, there's all sorts of cool things we can do built in with math. But to do them, um, typically up at the top, we'll add this line. It's called import. And import says, hey, go give me this package out of your library. So by default, when we run our Python programs, it's not importing the entire Python library because we, we don't need to reference all those other files. We don't need to pull any of that stuff in. Uh, it just makes things a little bit smoother for us. But if you want to use part of the library, 
we just say, okay, sure, I want to import math. And I want the math part of the library. There's all sorts of cool functions in the math library that we now will have access to just by using that import. So to use any of those now, we'll say math dot, and we get access to all the things in the math library. Like tons of math related things. Some of them are interesting, some of them are not. Um, so like you get constant values for pi, for e, um, infinity, not a number. Those are really kind of funny ones, but you could do like the arc cosine, the arc sine, the arc tangent. Um, seal is really handy. It's sealing, so it will round a value up to the nearest whole number. So if you give it a like 4.5, it's going to round up to 5. If you give it 4.000001, it will still round up to the next whole value. Um, you can do factorial of given numbers, which is fun. You can do this f mod. It's modulus, right? Uh, for our this is the remainder, the whole number remainder of division. Uh, we've got exponential here. So e to a given x, we can do a power with math.pow. So x to a y, right? Uh, square root. Give you the square root of a value. So essentially anything you can do in math we can do in the python math library it's pretty cool all sorts of functions out here um so to use them right we would just plug them right in so if we want to do ask them hey what let's take the square root of a number so we'll, we'll get a number to square root is an int of an input what number do you want the square root of Right, and then we can print, we'll do math dot square root of that number, number to square root. Sure. So it's math dot and then whatever value we want. Here we go, uh, what hour, what minute. Okay, what number do we want to square root? Uh, should we do the one that's not a very easy one, like 50? Seven point Oh, let me zoom wrong way. 7.0710 dot 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 on and on and on and on. Right? A little more than seven. That looks right. Go figure. Python can do some math. So the math library has all sorts of fun things that we can do in it. Really cool. Um, so it's not really a, a type here, uh, but it gives us access to all sorts of other things we don't have to do by hand, which is fun. Let's see. And then there's a, another section on binary values. Um, don't don't worry too much about it. I think we've talked a little bit about binary values. You'll get more into that in other classes. Um, again, that's our base two system, and that's everything is eventually stored in binary. So it's interesting to know that every piece of data that we ever interact with on computers is stored in some sort of binary format because the only thing we can store um, on a hard drive or whatever our, our medium happens to be is an individual bit it's on and off and we just combine lots of bits together so eight bits will make a byte and you combine a bunch of bytes together and you have some particular piece of information okay, so it all has to get boiled down to this binary format at some point which is fun um, and i'm a big fan of the windows calculator here so if you want to play with binary it's got this really cool binary bit mode so if you go to the programmer calculator then you can click on binary and this little bit toggling keypad here so each bit is the power of two based on its position so the first bit here is two to the zero which is a value of one or nothing so if it's on you get the value if it's off you don't so this is two to the one so it's a two if it's on right two in decimal here sorry um it's a one zero in binary that's right one and zero it's the two digits in binary that's a two it's off so you could do one we could do two and then three Right, is two and a one. And then four is one zero zero, five, one zero one, six, one one zero, seven, one one one. You just keep on going because each next digit is the next power of two. Right, so if we take, um, typically a, bits are put into bytes. So eight bits makes a byte. And our integer values are usually 32 bits or four bytes long. So the max value of an integer is usually about 2,147,000,000 or so 
Um, and we actually we need to save one of those digits so we can't use all of them here because one of those bits is used to say hey is this number positive or negative which is kind of fun um let's see what's that? that's our size of our python right size of python int Ooh, 24 bytes is that really that's really large. That seems wrong. Um, oh, it's unbounded. What is the max size? Python 2 doesn't tell us for Python 3. All right, cool. Yeah. So Python will let us store really, really big integers. That's pretty handy. We can calculate a Google, 10 to 100. Sys.max size. What do you think sys.max size is? Print sys.max size. Let's see what we get here. All right, here we go. So what is this number? There's ones, there's thousands, there's millions, there's billions, trillions, quadrillions. So nine centillion looks like the largest number we can get. What do you think max size plus one is? One, ten. Oh, look at that. It even did it. It did plus one. So Python deals with pretty large numbers. It, it's intelligent about how it stores it in integers. Other languages are not so good, um, and they're only going to store 32 bits worth, and you'll run into some other issues. So Python's pretty pretty handy here when we deal with our, our numeric values. Cool. All right, and then the rest of Chapter 3 has some additional practice, all good stuff there that we could work on. All right. Hey, Dodo, how you doing today? Happy Thursday, my friend. I'm sorry, you're not Dodo. That's right. I don't, what should I call you? Handles are always fun like that. Dodo. Easy. Crump man, I should call you Pigeon? <laughs> Alright, so let's take a look at our first project here then. Pull back up. Canvas here. And we'll add a new project here. Project one. So we'll have two weeks for this one. So two weeks from today puts us into October already. Wow. Um, it's going to be due before class starts. So that way I can go over the solution in class. So due 3.30 in two weeks. Uh, we'll say this is probably about 10 points or so. And pull this up. All right, and we want to submit a URL. I need to, oh, I gotta make that classroom link look real quick, I'm sorry. Make this link for you here. So we're gonna submit the feedback pull request URL. One five oh one. Here we go. Project one. Here's our Python template. Fantastic. Feedback pull requests. We're good to go. Ah, uh, yeah, the, the intro class. This is a, an intro to computer science class, so we just teach it in Python here, Dodo. What, what language is yours in? 
I surprised it if they'll get far into data structures. Um, that's it's usually a little more advanced. We wait till like the second semester for that. All right, awesome. So I got the link. We're good there. Oh man, almost out of coffee. This is no good. All right, so we're going to um, build a, 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 this is a little bit basic, but that's okay, because um, we, we haven't gotten all that far in. Um, ooh, and C, C is a lot of fun, Dodo. Um, so we're going to do a, a little calculator here for somebody for a retirement calculator. So a very basic retirement calculator. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is ask the user for their name and use their name in all of the following prompts for more information. Right, so we'll say, hey, what's your name? And then every other prompt, hey, so-and-so, please tell me this. So-and-so, tell me this. So-and-so, tell me this. Right? So we're going to ask the user um, how much money they have saved in their bank savings account. Okay, so their bank savings account, and we'll ask the user how much money they have saved in... Um, so this is a very gross oversimplification of savings, but don't worry too much about it. We'll say bonds. Um, so typically bonds have a, a guaranteed yield, but it's it's lower than some other investment types here, but that's okay. I'll ask the user how much money they have saved in, um, I mean, stocks, uh, you know, it, usually you do like funds and other things or the market. Um, Sure, we'll just we'll just say general stocks. Um, and, and you know that's probably mutual funds or other sorts of things here. Okay. And uh, what we should also ask the user how much money they have saved underneath their mattress. Right. Some people like to save cash and we're again just pretending like sure they throw it underneath their mattress here. Um, and that's fine. And then we'll ask the user for their age. Ask the user for the age they wish to retire here, right? So, okay, how old are you now? And how old do you want to be when you retire? Um, we'll ask the user um, how much money they will add to each type of retirement savings each year. So like how much money are you going to put underneath your mattress every year for your retirement savings? How much money are you going to put in your bank every year for retirement savings? How much money are you going to put in your bonds? All right, so that's mattress, savings, bonds, stocks, right? Up, up and up and up and up, up, going, 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 right? So some, some sort of value here, right? Okay. So how much are we going to add each additional year? Then um, we're going to calculate the future value of their savings in the year they retire. All right. So if you're 20 now and you want to retire at 70, that's for 50 years. We're going to add more money to each account. And then that money is also going to, to earn interest for a savings account. Um, so banks, mattress. Money under the mattress obviously earns no interest. Um, money in a bank savings account increases. We'll, we'll be very generous here and say 2% each year. Um, you know, we should probably go 1%, right? Because I don't think you're getting anything better than that. Um, oh, that sounds pretty cool, Dodo. Very cool. All right, and uh, then we'll say money in bonds... Um, increases by, I don't know, what's the 10-year ten, ten T-note yield? So you can buy a treasury bond. Um, maybe, maybe we'll go larger. That's the value of it here, not how much it gives you back. Oh, uh, goodness. 
Why? Okay, I'm not finding the number I want here. No, that's not yield. Uh, interest. Interest rate. Let's see. Okay. Ooh, 1.47. Ooh. Okay, so we'll, the 30-year note is 2% here. So we'll say 2% here for bonds. Ugh. That's... Okay, sure. So, like 2%. But again, it's it's relatively guaranteed. Hey, Crow. Yeah, this is... Are you asking Dodo or me? <laughs> it's probably Dodo. Hey, Mandawi. Um, so, yeah, 2% or so. Sure. Um, money invested... Or money in... And again, stocks, this is a really, really awful broad term here. Uh, but if you look at, like, the S&P 500 average return... Says about 10% through 2019. Now the problem with this is it's it's really bad here, right? Um, so don't don't worry. Like um, this is not how it actually works. We're saying hey, on average, if you put money in, it'll go up by 10% every year. Some years it could go down, and like some years it goes down a whole lot. Uh, but then it might come back up. Or historically, has come back up. So we'll we'll say you know this. Uh, increases by 10% each year. Okay, so we'll have to do a little bit of math here. Now, you folks are at least all in Calc 1, so I, I'm betting you can figure out the math here. The, the math part's not all that interesting. Oh no, this is Bing. Um, yeah, um, this is... So I like Bing rather than Google uh, for a couple reasons. One, Google already has enough of my data, and two, Bing gives me free coffee. Um, you, you these like points every time you search because they are like essentially buying customers um, and if you, you search enough and get enough points they'll give you a Starbucks gift card and then I can get free coffee so um, I'm, I'm happy to sell my data to them right that, that's essentially the trade-off right uh, we're, we're selling our data to them they get all my search history they got all that stuff they can use to advertise to me in trade they're giving me free coffee and it's not even a lot of free coffee but you know it's better so Google what you're getting is their service for free I mean, they're not giving you anything additional other than that, but at least you're getting the search service for free. So you're getting the search service for free from Bing, plus free coffee. Yeah, you know, I mean, honestly, I'm a bit of a Microsoft fanboy anyway, so like, I like a lot of Microsoft things, and I think it's good to have several major players in the market, too. Um, if Google was the only search engine ever, it, it can cause all sorts of problems, I think, right? Uh, you don't want to have just a single monopoly. Uh, ideally, so... Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to use Bing, and I'll, I'll take the free coffee and the points that they give me. All right, so what we need to do then, right, calculating this future value. <laughs> yeah, and this is Edge. I'm using Edge. Um, this is their, it's their Chromium version of Edge, which actually has, has some issues. Um, it, it slows down my computer every now and then, but I have gone and uninstalled Chrome because that's essentially spyware. Not that this Edge isn't, but again, I'm sort of like selling that data to Microsoft. Okay, so um, so the, not the future value, sorry, the total value of their savings. So for every, so if you're 20 and you want to retire at age 70, right, for 50 years, your money in the bank savings is going to increase by 1%, right? Now, if you're also adding more money every time, we need to be increasing that value every time as well, right? A <laughs> small price for free coffee, for sure, Trumpet Man. Um, I think it's like um, probably like every month or so I get like a five dollar gift card or something. I forget. It's been a little while, so I've got decent number of points right now. I haven't actually been to Starbucks in a while. Um, now that I'm getting out of the house again, I'll probably go back to Starbucks more. But uh, there, there's a little local coffee shop around the corner that I've been going to more often because uh, it's closer um, and it's cool. Like it's it's a nice little cool little atmosphere. Um, she runs a nice little shop. Anyway. Um, you know, let, let's forget about this adding every year. Um, don't worry about that. Um, no, no big deal. So, because that that'll make our math a little bit trickier as we go trying to add this in every time. Um, so we just how much money is in there, their age, and then what what the value is going to be in the future. Here. Um, so I got money. Here the mattress doesn't increase year after year. Right, if you just stick cash under your mattress, bury it in the back of whatever you do, like it doesn't, you don't earn any interest here, right? And then we want to show display the value of each type um, when they reach retirement. 
when they reach the retirement age. So, hey, oh, thank you, Vendelli. Yep, I gotta get up my little backboard here. I'm gonna grab this guy. I have a real bad slouching problem. Probably should get a better chair. Oh, but now I hit my head. <laughs> All right, uh, the value when they reach the retirement age. Then we're gonna calculate the present value of their retirement savings. Given, and let's uh, look up inflation rate US average. So, uh, again, maybe it's hard to find an actual average here, but let's say inflation, um, inflation data, is it three? Might be. Okay, averaged 3.23% from 1914 to 2021. But, like, I don't know. So, sure, we'll say, we'll say 3%. Why not? Given a fixed 3% inflation rate. So what that means um, is that every year, everything increases in price by 3%. And not, not necessarily everything, but in general, cost of living increases by 3% every year. Right? Bread gets more expensive, milk gets more expensive, gas gets more expensive cars get more expensive, right? And anything that we're doing, all of our services get more expensive. And it's not everything across the board, but in general, we'll say, we'll say it's a fixed 3%. Again, go take an economics class. It's super interesting. Um, you can do more, um, better, better things here. But you'll see if things get 3% more expensive and we're only getting like 2% each year on our bonds, we're, we're actually losing purchasing power every year. It's not keeping up with that inflation. Right, the bank savings account at 1%, even worse. So stocks, yeah, at 10%, again, and it's not always 10% up, 10% down, or, you know, sometimes it goes down and whatnot. And then your timing is bad if you retire in the, the midst of it being down. Um, that sucks. Yeah, but no, that's that's a great question. <laughs> that is a great question. Um, again, you could take some sort of finance or economics class, but um, typically bonds are considered safer investments because they will never go down. So uh, a typical investment strategy is when you're younger, you invest in the riskier things like stocks because if it goes up and down a little bit, you don't really care as long as you're averaging a return. Because if you're not retiring for 50 years or 40 years or 30 years, you can ride out some of those ups and downs. But as you get closer and closer to retirement, if the market's going to go down 20%, you don't want to lose 20% of your retirement savings. So you start putting more and more into these safer bond investments that aren't going to go down just because the market does. Um, and then as you get like into retirement, you, you typically want to have most of it in some sort of, if this is not going to go majorly down on me here, uh, you might keep some in your stocks. And again, depends on your level of risk tolerance and that sort of thing. Anyway, so the, the present value of the retirement savings give, given a fixed 3% inflation rate. So what that means is every year, every year from now until retirement, uh, you can purchase 3% less with your money. So uh, if I fire up the calculator here, and again, you're, we're going to do this in Python, but we'll, we'll take a look at the little pipe calculator here. Um, if I take 1.03 and I take it to the, let's just say in 20 years, right? The inflation factor is that everything is going to cost 1.8% or 1.8 1, 1 times as much money. Over after 20 years because at three percent every year right three percent but then it's not just three percent plus three percent plus three percent plus three percent because it compounds so it's three percent of the already three percent gain and then another three percent of already the three percent of the three percent on and on and on and on um yeah accumulating debt as early as possible uh, but now that's that's definitely a sore subject for a lot of people um it's uh yeah that's that is a little bit rough but Ideally, you're investing in yourself and investing in a major that will help you get a good, well-paying job or something that you can, you've learned enough that you can go out and be entrepreneurial and start your own business, uh, if that's your thing. And then you can pay off that debt that you've accumulated. Um, so I think a lot of people say it depends on what major you pick. Um, you know, some of it also depends on how much risk you're willing to take and go out and start your own business, have your own idea here. Um, but yeah, um, student debt is, is, is rather, uh, it's, it's, it's a bit nuts. Right. So that's just 20 years. So if I was going to, so if I'm age 20 now, 
right? I'm not 20, but if, if you folks were like age 20 now and you're going to retire in 50 years, 1.03 to the 50 means everything will cost 4.3 times as much money. So if bread is a dollar now, we're saying in 50 years, given a 3% inflation rate, bread will cost $4.38. So whatever your future total amount of money that you've saved is, right? So we need to divide the total future savings by the um, inflation factor, right? Which is 1.03 to the 10 years until retirement. Okay. So sure. Does that, that part make sense? Now, the other thing, right, our money is going to increase. So if you put some money away, and, and this is a terrible calculator here because it's not letting you add money every year, but that, that math gets a little bit harder here. But if I were to say, okay, let's take all the money we have in stocks and say, hey, let's just throw, if we had um, $1,000 in stocks, again, just an oversimplification. But if we took that, I'm sorry, um, not yet. So not 1000 yet. So we want, um, clear that out, sorry. So if we had 1.1, right, to the 50 years, our money's going to increase 117 times Right, that's pretty good. So putting in a thousand dollars, right? If you multiply that out, you, you get a decent amount of gain there just for a thousand dollars. So this idea of this compound interest and the compounding power of if you go up ten percent every year, ten percent every year, ten percent every year, is pretty cool. Um, and Excel is a great tool for this. Uh, we, we don't actually have enough Python under our belts to do this in more detail. We're just going to do some some simple mathematics here just to practice. But if we take a look at Come on. Let's go Excel. Excel is a fantastic tool. It really is. If it ever loads. Maybe it's just my computer here. Come on. All right, here we go. So we'll say this is year. We'll say this is uh, total value. So at year one, if we had a thousand dollars in there um, we'll format this one as dollars here great and this is year two and three and on and on and on just drag this down we get to 50 here okay so each year then we're going to take the current value and we're going to add to it the previous value times one point um, sorry times 0.1 or we are just current value times 1.1 Right, and we'll just drag this, copy this formula down. So Excel is really good at like repeating stuff. I like Excel. We'll see that simple thousand dollars, right, turns into 106,000. Oh, I think if we did one more year, because we didn't actually add any interest initially. I think my, my first year there was a little bit off. Let me pull that down one more. There we go. Yeah, 117,000, right? And that's what we had calculated. Can I zoom that in a little bit for you? Sorry. Um, where's our zoom? Oh, whoa. Too much? Too little? There we go. So just $1,000, if you just let it sit for 50 years and you're earning 10% interest every year, that adds up a whole lot right? with just $1,000. So imagine you, you put in more, right? Or the next year you put in more money and the next year you put in more money and the next year you put in more money, right? It doesn't have to be a whole lot. Uh, and we'll, we'll play with some of this later as we learn a little bit more Python, get a little bit more under our belt. But essentially, we're just going to calculate this out. Now, the problem, though, right, is that it's not actually worth as much as that, right? Because we said, what was our inflation factor after 50 years? Let's see. So that was 1.03 to the 50. Uh, so divided by 4.38. Right? So that equals this divided by 4.38. So really only worth $26,000 in today's money. That's a big difference, right? Still much more than a thousand, but not as nice as that actually looks, right? After 50 years, because thanks to inflation. I mean, again, it's not not everything always increases in costs, um, thanks to technolo technological improvements and that sort of thing. Um, but just in general, it's sort of a, a broad based number here. And then go take more econ, more finance, and we can go from there, All right? So don't worry too much about the math. Right, so that's our um, 
So that will be multiply by 1.1 to the n years of retirement, right? And on and on and on. Multiply by 1.02 to the n years until retirement, right? 1.01, right? And this one, nothing, nothing changes. Right. So adding additional money every year would be nice, but again, the math for that is going to be a little bit trickier, so we're not going to worry about that right now. Uh, we'll figure that out in a couple chapters. That makes sense for now? So we got two weeks to work on this one. And again, just a, a little bit bigger, a little bit more complex, working with a couple more variables here. Um, and then let me add a rubric for you here, so we will see exactly how you're going to get your points. Um, I'm a big fan of having rubrics on things. It makes scoring a little easier, and then you all know what to expect as well. Goodness, why is Canvas so slow? Is it just my computer slow? I just mean my computer. Oh, that shouldn't be my computer though, because that's I'd hit save in Canvas. No, so points, right? But now we only matter within the given category. So overall, all the points for assignments make up 25% of your overall score. So just because a lab is worth 10 points and a project is worth 10 points, doesn't mean the points are worth the same in your overall score. Right, so this is 10 points of the projects category. Come on. Hit save, Canvas. Come on. It's killing me here. I don't know what it's doing. Broke Canvas, I guess. I don't have to type this all over again. Let me copy all that real quick, just in case. Throw that in Notepad. Okay. Although if Canvas is freaking out, at least I'll still have it. I don't know what it's doing. Okay, let me just like refresh the page and see what Canvas does. Okay, I lost it all. That's all right, I can paste it back in. This is why I copy paste. Right, submission, online, URL, due date's great, save and publish, come on. Let's go Canvas. You can do it Canvas. There it goes. All right, awesome. So again, grab the repository, right? make a clone of that repository, and put your project in that repository folder. So github.com will be able to get it. Okay? And I should be able to go from there. Any other thoughts, questions, or concerns, folks? Now, we'll call it a day. I'll see you folks in lab on Monday. And then we'll pick it up with the next chapter, um, branching, on Tuesday. Um, branching, gets uh, we get a whole lot more fun in Python once we start adding a couple more tools under our belt. Branching and, and loops are a lot of fun. All right. Awesome. Let's see. Um, let me put on my ending screen here then. And we'll see if there's anyone out there in Twitch land we should raid for fun. Let's see who's around. I don't know what's going on. Like, I don't know if it's just Canvas or me. It's slow for you folks. I think all the internet's just slow. Yeah, it's timing out on me now. All right, I don't think the raid's going to work. Uh, you folks take care. I'll see you around.